we'll read the gospel according to okay. according to Saint Matthew chapter twenty four. At that time, as Jesus was sitting on Mount Olivet, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the consummation of the world? And Jesus answering said to them, Take heed that no man seduce you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they will seduce many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be pestilence and famines, and earthquakes in places. Now all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to, the, to be afflicted, and shall put you to death. And you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be scandalized, and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall seduce many. And because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. But he that shall persevere to the end, he shall be saved. That's for the words of today's Holy Gospel. So then, the Father and the Ghost, Amen. Well, first of all, my name is Father Pfeiffer, Father Joseph Pfeiffer, and I'm from uh, Kentucky, the Holy Land of Kentucky. When you learn catechism class, when I teach the converts, they have to learn to be baptized where the Holy Land is, and they will learn that that is in Kentucky. So there is an actual place in Kentucky which is called the Holy Land, which, the, which is a place for many Catholics, many nuns, many, many um, uh, priests, and, uh, and uh, in 1800 to 1850, during that 50-year period, it was the source of the missionaries of the United States, and that uh, the Bardstown, Kentucky Diocese uh, was the diocese from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico, from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River, plus Minnesota and Iowa, and monks and nuns and sisters came there, and many, many missionaries came from that area out to evangelize the West. And, uh, and so the Protestants who hated Catholics in the 1840s, they killed many Catholics in the area. There were martyrs there. And they called the place, the little area from which I am from, they called it the Holy Land where all those damn Catholics live. And so the name stuck. It's still called the Holy Land of Kentucky. And uh, so that's the, uh, there was a Catholic area. And of course, since Vatican II, like everywhere else in the church, now there's 100-year-old nuns, closed convents, and uh, a loss of faith everywhere. And so that those days of faith, are almost finished there in Kentucky, like in each place in the world today since Vatican II. And then also here, celebrating the Latin Tridentine Mass. This is the Mass of the Catholic Church. This is the Mass of our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that the Mass is the crucifixion. The Mass is not the Last Supper. We don't gather together for a party with our Lord. We don't gather together for a dinner, for some good food and some nice grub. We gather together for our crucified Master. We gather together to stand at the foot of the cross of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We gather together with St. John. We gather together with the weeping holy women. We gather together also with the enemies of God, who will always be at this cross. The enemies will be there that they might make sure that he is crucified. And that is why there will always be Judases at the cross. There will always be Caiaphases at the cross. There will always be bystanders and soldiers who care not about God at the cross. There will always be the enemies of God at the cross. And this shall be a cause of scandal to many. But there will also be his friends. They will all be at the cross. And when we are at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we are at the cross. We are at Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That's one reason why in the Latin Mass we worship God. We don't worship man. We worship God. We face this crucifix. We put our hearts and minds upon the stone of the uh, rock of Golgotha. And we prepare for God becoming man on the altar. And today we have the feast of St. Januarius. And it's good to be here in San Diego. It's my first time in San Diego. So it's, uh, you know, in the Southern California. And, uh, and so it's uh, good to be here in the San Diego. My first time here. But nonetheless, it's, uh, 
It's uh, you know, and also it's also telling me that the cool weather came today. It was hotter earlier, so it's a good. And I, I used to live only six hours from here in Phoenix, Arizona, where where this is frozen winter weather here, <laughs> and uh, and so that uh, for nine years I was in Phoenix, and I was stationed in California, uh, and in '96 I was stationed in California in Los Angeles. Only I never arrived, but I was officially stationed there for about nine years. But they temporarily sent me to Phoenix. And I remained temporarily in Phoenix for nine years. And I never arrived in my assignment in California. The superiors sometimes can't make up their minds. And so my name was still listed, but I never arrived. I never arrived. I was sent temporarily to Phoenix, remained there for nine years. And then over to Asia, over to the Philippines and India, back to the Philippines, and now going around the world with the Latin Trinity Mass and the, the true faith. Which is, which is the, the only answer to all the troubles in the world today. But today a few considerations on the little gospel today and St. Januarius. So again, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Januarius, or Gennaro, is one of the great saints of the city of Naples in Italy. And Gen Januarius was a bishop. And just briefly concerning his martyrdom, he was a bishop, and he was brought before the magistrate for having practiced the Catholic faith. And about five or six of his companions, deacons and priests, several different companions, were also dragged before him. When he began his martyrdom, that is, St. Januarius and his companions, he began with first one, then two, then eventually six companions. And they were taken and thrown into the fire. They were thrown into a place and burned in the fire. And when they were in the fire, they didn't get hot. It was like the three young men in the fiery furnace. They were in no way scorched, scorched uh, harmed in any way. Coming out of the boiling furnace, they were not hurt. They were not. They were not hurt in any way. They weren't even hot or sweating. There was no damage done to them. And the magistrate of Naples was extremely angry, and so he then commanded that they 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 should be uh, stretched. He should be stretched on the rack, and all his joints pulled apart and pulled by wagons and ropes. And they pulled apart all his joints and beat him. And, and, and then they, they wanted him to be put into, the, into the, the, the amphitheater, something like the Colosseum, but one outside of Rome, to be eaten by the wild beasts. And having sent the wild beasts in to eat him and his six companions, all of the lions and the wild and tigers and wild beasts came, and they licked the wounds of uh, Januarius. And they gathered around him, and they protected him, and they were licking his wounds and healing his wounds instead of eating him. And the, the, the magistrate was exceedingly angry. And seeing this, he was struck blind by God. And being unable to see and blind, he was upset. Januarius realized that the poor magistrate who wanted to put him to death was blind. And so he prayed, and he gave him a blessing. And his blindness was cured. And when the blindness of the magistrate, his enemy, was cured, 5,000 of the bystanders in the, judge, in, in the stands converted to the faith. And, they, and, and the magistrate was then extremely angry. Now it's 5,006 companions of Januarius. <laughs> and he was exceedingly angry. And we learned that he was in no way affected by the cure. He was in no way affected by the miracle. He was in no way affected by the blindness. Neither was he affected by the curing of the blindness, but at each moment he became more wicked, and therefore he decreed the death of all of them. And Januarius was killed with his 5,006 companions, and then, after his death, his body was taken to Naples. And every year, on this feast of St. Januarius, his, in many miracles happened, for instance, shortly after his death, the Vesuvius mountain exploded, and there was a major lava that flowed around the city. And it was protected by Januarius. He protected it from earthquakes. He protected Naples from, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, volcanoes and from many catastrophes. And every year on the Feast of St. Januarius, the blood that is inside of a vial is placed next to his head. And the blood boils and the blood moves. And if the blood moves that year, then there will be no great catastrophe in Naples. But there are some years since the time of St. Januarius where the blood does not coagulate, and the blood does not boil, and if that happens, in that year, there will come a great catastrophe. And one year they were attacked by the enemies and besieged, another year there was an earthquake, 
And every single year in which this doesn't happen, some punishment for God comes upon the Naples. And every year to this very year, 2014, they gather in the cathedral to see if the blood is going to coagulate. And they wait to see if the blood is going to move. And so the St. Januarius continues to perform miracles almost 2,000 years after his death. He died in 305 A.D. And 1,700 years later, he still performs miracles. And we have the Gospel today. Januarius was a bishop with a wicked king. And we are in an age in which wickedness is inverted. For instance, imagine the miracle of Januarius happening today, in which instead of being one emperor made blind, or not emperor, he was just a local magistrate, made blind, and one man witnessing great miracles, such as no fire touching, and miraculous protection from the lions, plus being personally made blind, plus being cured of blindness by the power of God, and yet he doesn't convert, but 5,000 others convert. That was in the good old days. No more. If this same miracle was to happen today, and there was a new Januarius, and 5,000 witnessed the miracle, and 5,000 were made blind, and 5,000 saw the power of the hand of God, and 5,000 were cured of the blindness, maybe one would convert. But the 5,000 would not convert. We are at the end of time. We are at the times in which man who sees good, man who hears truth, man who sees that which is wonderful, will despise it, will reject it until his dying breath. You can now fly in an airplane like we mentioned many times. You can buy a plane ticket and you can fly to visit Our Lady of Guadalupe. And you can see the miraculous image and take a picture next to it with your girlfriend who is not your wife. You can then go to a hotel that night and be in sin. You can abort your baby the next day. And you can show the picture on Facebook of how you were with Our Lady. You can then make another trip and see the miraculous body of St. Bernadette. And see how Bernadette is incorrupt. And she looks like she's taken a nap 160 years after she died. And you can put it on Facebook. And then quickly check out some pornography. And then make sure that you are living in the state of mortal sin. And then divorce your present girlfriend or your present boyfriend and go find someone more wicked and be more evil than you were before and abort another baby and practice more contraception and tie the tubes and make sure that no babies can be born and then promote all manner of evil. And then go and make another trip and visit the miraculous shrine of Our Lady of Quito and visit the miraculous hosts that are in Italy and in Portugal. And you can see so many miracles and take pictures and be more wicked than you were before. This is our age. And our Lord Jesus Christ said, there will be the end of times. We are in those times now. When there shall be wars and rumors of wars, there shall be of uh, all kinds of troubles and the earthquakes in various places. There will, be, uh, there will be droughts in places of wetness, like California. There will be massive floods in places of drought, like in the deserts in, 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 in Russia. And then there will be freezing cold in one place where it is always hot. There will be warmth in other places where it is cold. There will be tsunamis, and there will be great typhoons, and there will be uh, tornadoes, and there will be great catastrophes in various places. And each of these things is to call man to repentance for his sins. No one will repent. I returned to the Philippines last year after, see, after the greatest of all recorded typhoons. The greatest of all. The highest number of winds, the most number of deaths. And the priests say in the Philippines, you know the cause of this great catastrophe? Global warming. That's the problem. Global warming. And coming to the city of Armok, in the Philippines, and coming to the city of Tacloban, and going to these places that were hit by this great catastrophe, and what do they say? There's an opportunity to get money from the West. There's an opportunity 
to get advantages from the death of others, including their own neighbors and friends. And no one repents. No one says, God has sent this chastisement upon us because of our sins. Let us weep for our sins. You know that the, the, the king of Nineveh, he was more wise. When Jonas walked through the city and said that God would punish it, he put on sackcloth and ashes. He commanded that even the animals would fast. And all the men of the people would fast. And they would do penance. And God repented himself and he did not destroy that city. But nowadays we hear the warnings of God. And we see all the signs contained in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24. There are many false Christs performing wonders. This is called the charismatic movement. All these false miracles. He that has eyes to see, let him see. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. This is demonic practice which has entered into the Catholic Church that is all over the world and preparing for the coming of the Antichrist. And you can have all whatever level of the devil you want. You want, you want devil 100%? No problem. You want deluded Satan? We'll give you a little bit of deluded Satan. You want a very small amount of Satan? We'll give you a small amount. The only trouble is it's like rat poison. You read on DEFCON, on, on the uh, DECON. The rat poison. You know that rat poison that kills a rat is 99.9% .9 really good for rats. It's 0.1% of poison. And 100% of the rats that eat that poison are 100% dead. But there's only 0.1% of poison. And 99.9% .9 is healthy for rats. 99.9% .9 is tasty. 99.9% .9 is good. And so the devil doesn't care whether you want the 0.1% of Satan, and then you learn eternally in, da in hell, or you want the 99% of Satan, and you end eternally in hell. He doesn't care. He wants your soul in hell. He wants people to think they're good when they are not good. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ said, The time will come when they will throw you out of the synagogues. They will throw you out of the churches. That's why we're having Mass in the house. <laughs> They will throw you out of the churches thinking they do service to God. They are doing a crusade. Don't you realize it's terrible to have too many children? Don't you realize it's important to put that little corkscrew inside of your belly that will burn with you for all eternity? The little corkscrew that replaces the tying of the tubes called Eshur or whatever different version you happen to choose. You have a little Satan in your belly. It will burn. It will burn forever. But you know, you have to be responsible. You can't have another baby. You don't have enough money. You don't have the right, 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 right uh, preparation. It's just not responsible. You can't give them a good quality of life. And so therefore, violate the call of God. And spit on God. And curse God. And don't worry, smile and brush your teeth. Make sure you always use good deodorant. That way you feel clean. When the angels walk by, they smell sin. When the angels walk by, they smell what the heart is inside of the heart. And they are disgusted by the hearts of modern man. We are in a most wicked age. Here we have our Holy Father, the Pope. Shaking hands with the Muslims. And what are they doing? They are chopping off the heads of our people. And what is our Holy Father doing? Having lunch with them. What is he doing? Praising them. What is he doing? I don't believe in the Catholic God. What is he doing? He's telling them that they can pray to their God for the success of their venture, which is the destruction of Jesus Christ, the destruction of his Holy Church, the elimination of Christianity. And what is the Holy Father doing praying for the elimination of the church that he is supposed to be the head of? What is he doing praying for the death of the souls that he is supposed to protect? His sheep are being slaughtered. But he doesn't care. Because he has the favor of the world. And this is the temptation Our Lady of La Salette spoke about 150 years ago in France. She said, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. Now not very many people visit La Salette, a beautiful church on top of the hill, the statues of Our Lady, but it's a it's attack of our conscience. So 
So we don't like visiting that mountain anymore. So very few visit it now. And Our Lady of La Salette said, Rome will lose the faith. It will become the seat of the Antichrist. The Blessed Virgin Mary said, In the 20th century, she said in Quito, Ecuador, in South America, In the 20th century, the priests will lose the divine compass. They won't have a magnetic pole anymore. They won't know which way God is. They won't even know how to pray to God. Because in the Mass, they won't pray to Him. They'll pray to the people. Instead of praying to God, they'll take the crucifix and remove Jesus Christ from it. When they are supposed to be the bringers of a cross upon the Christ upon the cross to all souls, and they won't be able to do it anymore. What's happened? We are in the times spoken of by our Lord. And there will become great hatreds. And here is one of the answers of the troubles of our times. If we get, uh, get more bookmarks here than Father Gonzalez. <laughs> We've got so many bookmarks. We'll find the page is not marked. <laughs> and so, all nations, they will put you to death, think to do a service to God, and so on. And then shall many be scandalized, and shall betray one another, and they shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall seduce many. And because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. But he that shall persevere unto the end, he shall be saved. The charity of many will grow cold, because iniquity abounds. Iniquity abounds. We see an example of this in Gaza. You kill my mother, I forgive. Then you kill my father, and I forgive. Then you kill my brother, and I began to get angry. <laughs> and then you kill another cousin, and then you kill my child. And the Jews continue to kill every day, every single day. But then one day, they get angry. One day they turn to evil and they become more evil or as evil as the ones that attack them. This is what Satan wants. We turn evil for evil and turn to evil. Because iniquity abounds, charity grows cold. What's the answer? What's the answer? You know that in about the year 400 or... Uh, 750 A.D., around that time, was now part of Germany in Frisia. Some Benedictine monks went and set up a monastery in the middle of the woods. And the Frisians came and said, we don't like Catholics, we don't like monks. And so they killed them, 200 monks, burnt down the monastery. Three months later, more monks came and rebuilt the monastery. Another hundred monks. The Frisians came, didn't we kill you guys a few months ago? <laughs> and they killed them all. Burnt out the monastery. Mm. A few months later, another hundred monks came and rebuilt the monastery. Mm. And they came back and said, didn't we kill you guys before? And they killed them all. Mm. A few months later, more monks came and built the monastery. And they came and said, what's wrong with you guys? Mm. And they said, we follow Jesus Christ, and you must follow him too. And they converted. But it took a burning of a monastery, and a burning of a monastery, and a burning of a monastery, and the killing of monks, and the killing of monks, and the killing of monks, and then charity defeated the enemies of God. Times have not changed. God has not changed. Many will be scandalized because you will see wicked priests. If you haven't seen them, it's only because you've never met a priest or you're blind. <laughs> but you will see wicked priests. You will see wicked bishops. You will see the wicked behavior of popes like these last popes. And this wickedness will scandalize many. And you will see wicked Catholics. And you will see them turn one against another. And you will see hatred, and you will see violence. And many will become scandalized. And the Lord said, Charity shall grow cold, 
and they will learn to hate one another. Now remember, the enemies of God always hate each other. When robbers rob a bank, they love money, but they hate each other, and they always have. And once they finish robbing the bank, they then kill each other. The enemies of God always hate one another. What our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24 are the friends of God. The time will come when the friends of God will always hate one another. When they will look at each other and say, are you a spy? <coughs> are you a spy? Are you with them? Are you with them? In the beginning they will have doubts. In the beginning they will have worries. But over time, wickedness shall enter into their hearts. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, It shall become so bad that the devil will deceive, if possible, even the elect. What are we to do? What is the answer? The answer is faith. And that's what it says in the epistle. <clears throat> the man who lives by faith, he shall be saved. The one who lives by faith, he shall be saved. But how do we live by faith? We live by faith <coughs> by living like our Lord Jesus Christ. What is it that caused him to walk the way of the cross? His apostles abandoned him. His disciples abandoned him. The holy women were weeping in the distance with useless tears. Why did he go on this cross? <coughs> the holy women did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the victory of Christ. They thought he was defeated. St. John stood at the foot of the cross out of respect for the Holy Mother and out of love for Jesus Christ, but he did not believe he was a king at that point. And what was written on the top of the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Pilate knew he was a king, and John did not. We find this now in the crisis of the church. They are making our church more and more illegal. You can't have a nativity set in public. If you say that homosexuality is evil, it's a hate crime. If you speak the truth of faith, you are, you are in danger of being arrested because the devil knows that Jesus Christ is in charge in San Diego. The devil knows he's supposed to rule on these beaches of naked people. The only one that doesn't know that are the priests who visit those beaches. The only one that doesn't know that are the bishops. Like the bishop here in San Diego... <clears throat> who said back in 2004, I saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And he gives the impression like he didn't do anything wrong. He <clears throat> gives the impression that Jesus Christ didn't make any mistakes. <clears throat> that's the impression that it gives. That's the, impression that, that's the impression that it gives. The bishop didn't know that Jesus Christ was innocent. He thought that Mel Gibson's betrayal of the death of Christ made the Jews look too bad and Christ look too innocent. Surely Christ made mistakes. Now the bishops think Christ made mistakes. The Pope thinks Christ made mistakes. The priest thinks Christ made the mistake. And we're going to do better than Christ. We're going to make a new church with priests that don't need to wear cassocks. With priests that don't need to preach the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. With priests that don't need to offer the holy sacrifices of the Mass. With priests that don't need to preach the divine truth. With priests that don't need to condemn the errors of the world. Who don't need to repeat the words of Jesus Christ. What did these words lead to? <coughs> they led to victory. How did they lead to victory? Because they pulled the sin out of Caiaphas. <coughs> they pulled the wickedness out of the enemies of God. And they made them crucify him. And when they crucified Jesus Christ, what happened? Satan was defeated. Satan was destroyed. That's what happened. And so, Satan was defeated and Satan was destroyed. That is what happened on the cross. When this holy sacrifice is the Mass, when it is said with the faith, and when it is united to the true church, it tortures the damned in hell. And that's a good thing to do. It burns Satan more. And it brings about the reminder to Lucifer that he has been defeated by the cross of Christ. But he is so blind. He is so proud. He is so confident in his own wickedness 
that he will repeat the same mistake again. <coughs> he will be the one. The devil will be the one. Excuse me. That's no good. No, that's okay. The devil will be the one. That's good. That's good. The devil will be the one who will bring the sword with which he himself shall be vanquished. The devil will be the one to bring the bullets with which he shall himself be killed. <coughs> the devil will be the one. Just like he's the one that created the, made the cross. Who made the cross? Satan made it. <coughs> and what did this cross cause? It caused the destruction of the kingdom of hell. So the devil now is crucifying the Catholic Church. That's what's happening. Why are millions of Catholics no longer believing the teachings of our Holy Church? Why is it that as the devil persecutes the church, those that are supposed to be the defenders of the church, you know the bishop is given a hat, which is called a mitre. It has two points on it. And when he is consecrated a bishop, the bishop consecrated him, puts the, horn, puts the mitre on his head, and it says, Receive the horns. Receive the horns of the two testaments, and with these horns drive away the wolves from the sheep. <coughs> but now, they have nerf horns. They are not useful for anything. And they do not use the horns that God gave them in order to defend the sheep. They do not use the horns that God gave them to defend the Holy Gospel. They do not use the horns that God gave them to drive terror to the enemies of God. And that's what the truth does. That's what the faith does. That's what the cross does. They know this is the only thing that can defeat Satan. Therefore, Jesus Christ hates it. The devil hates it. And the devil wants Jesus Christ removed from the cross. He wants him taken away. So you look inside of our new churches, the cross is absent. Because they have driven Christ out of the church. But he is still there. <clears throat> and he will not be defeated. What is the answer? We cannot, we must live by faith, and we cannot let charity grow cold. <clears throat> we cannot let charity grow cold. We will be hated. We will be attacked. We will be despised. What are we to do? Return charity. Our Lord Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross, looked down upon Caiaphas. Looked down upon Judas. Looked down upon all his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Or were they all forgiven? No. Judas met Jesus Christ in his justice. When Jesus Christ said to Judas, Depart from the accursed and everlasting fire. And Caiaphas met Christ in his justice. But that time is the time of death. <clears throat> that is the time when we pass into eternity. But while on this earth, we beg the grace that this Judas repents. And this Caiaphas repents. Pilate was like Caiaphas. Peter, Peter rather, was like Caiaphas, but he repented. Caiaphas did not repent. Some will repent, many will not. But God wants to save all souls, though he knows that most souls will reject him. In Januarius, as he went to death, he performed miracles of healing. And January, as he went to death, prayed for the conversion of those that came to watch his death. Like unto a spectator, they wanted to watch it live on TV. Well, they were watching the what, a reality TV show. And they wanted to watch January die. And they thought it was great. But he prayed for them. And 5,000 were converted. You know that our Lord Jesus Christ still knows how to convert souls. It is done by faith and charity. Let us maintain our faith and live by it with charity <clears throat> and not fall into the trap of hating one another, which will be our temptation. Of turning true evil against one another, which will be the temptation of the devil with those that are supposed to be the friends of God. And let us not fall into that trap. Though we must condemn boldly the errant, <clears throat> we must also sometimes condemn individuals and put them to death if necessary. But we cannot ever, ever turn away from charity. It cannot be. The time will come 
when they will say, you must fight in another way. We cannot fight in another way. We fight with a sacred charity. It is by us dying that souls are converted. It is by us living in sacred charity that the grace of God converts other souls. It is by us communicating the sacred truth in the face of lies and living according to that truth and sacred charity that souls will be converted. And we cannot turn the evil and wickedness and the ways of our modern world and turn not to hatred, which will be the temptation of the near future of those that are the friends of God. Let's not fall into that trap. We'll close that. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.